Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our series of webinars for the launch of the new version of Commosus. Last week, we got an amazing response from everyone who attended the Steel Detailing webinar. I was hesitant to create a webinar lasting almost two hours, but to my pleasant surprise, some of you actually watched even that long video more than once to understand it better. Now, that shows that our audience is receptive and they like what they're seeing in Commosus. What it also shows is they want change. So emboldened by that, uh, that wonderful experience, I decided not to hold back and try to show you as much as I can today as well. So today I'll be talking about concrete modeling. Today I'll be talking about rebar modeling. And today I will also be talking about concrete and rebar drawings extracted from the 3D model. Now, I know from my research that the concrete and rebar industry hasn't really embraced 3D modeling the way the steel industry has. And there are many reasons for this. Some are technical challenges, while others are merely psychological barriers which get in the way of decision makers. I will try to present Commosus to you in such a way which relieves both your technical as well as psychological fears. I will try my best to make modeling look like a walk in the park. I'm hoping to win over many new converts today. I'm hoping you will leave this webinar, webinar having decided to give 3D concrete and 3D rebar a chance. I'm hoping that concrete lovers will not stay behind and give their steel brethren a run for their money. But most importantly, I want you and your business to benefit from 3D modeling. If you can reduce your man hours by just 20%, you can perhaps double your profits. But I'm here to tell you that with the right skill sets, you can reduce your man hours by half, if not more, if you use 3D modeling for both concrete as well as rebars. And that's not all. The quality of your work will also skyrocket. That's what 3D modeling is supposed to do when done properly. So let's start today's presentation. Now let's create some simple uh, beams and beams and columns. And this is not really uh, the area in which one program would typically excel over another. We can just copy a column around, for example. We can enter some uh, beams, use the same copy array command to copy it to, across the columns. Obviously, got one more copy. If you use the same numbers, I can delete the last the last part. This is extra, and I can then zoom in and uh, enter the beam on the other side. Use the same copy array method to copy the beams as well. Then I can delete this extra one, and then I can look at it from the side. For example, I can uh, maybe delete a part of the building like that. Maybe if I want, I can select the joints only and after doing that i can just copy the uh, call the move command and move them up a bit secondly i can maybe delete this part of the building you know makes make some movement make it look a bit different from a standard copy so this part up till now what you've seen is pretty much uh, this kind of data entry for normal buildings for high-rise buildings for any kind of building that's very simple it's when you get to the more complicated stuff that modeling starts consuming time. If it's only beams and columns and you're copying them around even 100 stories, that's not really much of an achievement. But when you really get to industrial type buildings with lots of uh, holes and channels and whatnot, and I'll talk about those in a second, that's when you get problems. And that's where one program will be different from the other. Now, let's create a slab. So all we do is just select any number of points, at least three. You can't enter less than three. But uh, if I'm going to select four points, and a slab will be created immediately at the floor level on which I'm working on. Now, one requirement, especially in industrial type buildings, is to have slab openings. So all we do is just go to the slab opening command, select our slab, and select a point. And immediately, an opening is created at that point. Now I can double click on this and a dialog box appears. So it's not just a dummy cut over there, but I can actually give 
uh, various sizes to this opening. So let me give these two sizes over here and say apply. And immediately the size of the opening is changes, changed as you can see in the in the 3D view as well. Let me remove the cuts from that from uh, from the 3D view so that you can uh, watch it more clearly. Another thing I can do is I can double click it again and I can give it an angle. So if I enter 30 degrees over here, you will see that the cut which was created is then turned at an angle of 30 degrees. Another thing which we can do is convert this into a circular uh, opening, for instance. So if I press this one, it converts it into a circular opening. I can bring it back by removing this flag, and that's as simple as that. Another very nice feature which I have is I can double click on this opening and I can say create a parapet around it. And when I do that, this little parapet is created around that opening as a separate intelligent object, by the way. So if I double click on that parapet now, I can give it the dimensions which I, which I want. So I can make this 500, make this 300. That'll change the dimensions of the parapet, as you can see on the screen. Or I can go inside again. And I can even give a thickness um, a width over here. And this, what it does is, is it creates a little place over here for some covers to come, which are very typical in industrial type uh, structures. You can have a cover over here, and that cover will need to sit on that concrete. So imagine normally if you were doing this with manual detailing with lots of cuts, you would have spent probably about 10, 15 minutes just getting this uh, parapet in order. But that's not all. If I continue uh, double clicking on the parapet, I can even ask it to create a cover for me. And there you go. My concrete covers for my industrial structure are there. And I can modify these and I can, um, these are customizable. Uh, all sorts of customiz uh, customizations are available. But the point I'm trying to make over here is that the simple command of creating a hole in the slab, which we started off with, has led into uh, so many details that that little hole Convert it into a, uh, a circular hole or any other sized hole, or you could make a parapet around it. You could give it certain dimensions. You can create a cover around it. So within a few clicks, and all these are actually uh, hindrances in normal, in other commercially available uh, modeling software, because just doing this, just finalizing this little hole, would will, will take half an hour, and typically detailers will try, will shy from that. But in Commosis you're free to do uh, this kind of detailing very, very quickly. Now, uh, instead of creating the parapet, which we just did, we can just directly create this little depression directly on that hole as well. So if I were to enter that, we can see that instead of the parapet, directly uh, I've created this uh, depression so, so that a cover can come directly in this on top of this hole. And this simple hole command doesn't even end there. I can even give chamfers. So I, if I give four chamfers to the corner points, I can create this sort of a chamfer around it if I wanted to. Or I could give it a different type of a chamfer if I wanted. I could remove this one, and I could give point number one a circular chamfer, and a totally different kind of an opening would be created. And it's not even that only. I could just double click on this, create a small hole, for example, go to my uh, this uh, chamfer tab, and I can have uh, a grid of holes if I wanted to. I can have them in both directions. So by the simple cut command, I've created several holes in that slab uh, in one go by, by just modifying the parameters of a single command, which, which, which we used for creating slab openings. So you can see that this kind of uh, versatility uh, is extremely useful when you're dealing with complicated situations, industrial plants, uh, and your um, normal modeling techniques, while available, uh, do take up a, lo a lot of time. But with Commosis, you can do the same stuff very, very quickly. And this is the reason why people give up uh, modeling in concrete, because they, uh, they feel that while entering just beams and columns is pretty quick, but um, actually getting down to uh, the individual anchor bolts, anchor boxes, holes, and this and that, uh, there's too much time to be lost and they'd rather do it in AutoCAD. But with Commosis, you can actually exceed the speed of AutoCAD by uh, multiples if you're, if you're good at using it. 
And there is even more to show you, but I just want to move on and just going to talk about it for a second. So, you know, around these holes, you even have these, these strengthening rag bolts at the corners so that, so that the corners don't break off. And they can be modeled directly uh, from within this command. So what started off as a very simple command to create a hole in a slab has ended up creating everything around that hole as well, uh, which is obviously necessary if you are going to complete the building and if you're going to uh, extract your 2D drawings from it. Because if you don't do this modeling, what will happen is that your 2D drawings will be incomplete. And uh, once they're in incomplete, you will have to finish them off in, in AutoCAD. And once you start doing that, and then there are revisions and more revisions and more revisions, so eventually what happens is your model gets uh, severed off from your drawings completely. So unless, I mean, the idea behind 3D modeling is that you should uh, model everything in the 3D model, not just half the building or part of the building. Because the moment you start modeling a part of the building, uh, it comes back to haunt you and eventually your model will be broken from your drawings and that will be the end of it. But with Commosis, you don't need to do that. You can actually model right down to the final rag bolt and uh, get, get on. Now let's enter a, a few walls. So I go to my wall button and I select two points basically. And the moment I do that, you can see on the 3D view that the wall has been created. Let's continue on the other side and create the wall over there as well. Now, as you can see over there, the, the height of the story is different. The height of the building is not the same as this side. So I just double click it and I change the top level to 5000. And my wall has been finalized. Now, if I open up the dialog box again, you can see that we have complete control over the top level of the wall, over the bottom level of the wall. So if I specify this to be, I say, minus 2000, uh, then the wall will continue to, to two meters down as well. So I have complete control over that. I have complete control over the thickness of the wall. Uh, I can give the height directly or by giving the ele elevation. I can give, give it some start and end offsets if I wanted to. And there are some, once again, details for the top of the wall. Once again, all these are um, features which save time. So if sometimes if there's something sitting on top of the wall, you can create this uh, kind of a feature at the top by directly entering some numbers instead of going through the normal procedure of using the cut command, etc. And uh, it's very easy to use, as you can see on the screen. Just enter two points and your wall is ready. Now, let's say there is an architectural requirement to create a window opening about, say, one meter uh, back of this axis over here. So I just go to my windows and doors opening. I select the wall and then I select this point over here and I just press enter and I say dy minus 1000 because that's the point I want to select. And the moment I do that, my window opening is, is created exactly at one meter from that uh, from that access point and then i can just double click on that and i can uh, change the level the, uh, the height for example right now it's at eight meters the top the top level is at eight meters i can change that to maybe um, 8500 if i want to what i can do is i can change the size of this opening just like we did in the other command i can make it wider i can make it uh, I can change the other dimension as well, as well if I want. I can even go over here and uh, create an entire grid of uh, window openings, for example. I can just enter distances just like I enter grid distances over here. And I can uh, make 20 copies of these along the wall if I, if I wanted to. Once again, I can give chamfers as well to the corners. So it's pretty comp uh, pretty detailed and uh, you can do a lot with this command as well, just like we could do with the other one. And you can even, even have a parameter over here. For example, if I were to enter 100 over here, I can even create a partial opening. What that means is if I turned off the cuts, for example, it can just create a depression in the wall, not, not a hole right, uh, right through the wall, but just a depression. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot uh, these commands do. They're, they look like simple commands to create openings in slabs and walls, but uh, they can be used to create openings of all sorts and uh, with different details. Um, in concrete modeling, uh, we usually have uh, continuous walls. Uh, so these are not walls which, is, which you can create with two points, but you need multiple points to define them. 
And uh, we, we can do that very easily with the folded plate command in Comosis as well. So let me just go through a few points. Let's go like that and right click. And immediately a wall is created by the default settings. Now, this is a bit more than just a normal classical folded plate, which you might be uh, used to. What you can do is you can uh, you can double click on the wall and you can go to the um, chamfer section. And this was point number one, two, three. So you can go to point number two and give it a, uh, say, a chamfer of 2000. And when you do that, you get that chamfer. I can continue. I can give the point number three. Uh, a chamfer of 2000 as well. I can continue, and what I can do is I can ask for the outer chamfer not to be created. So when I do that, you can see on the screen that the inner chamfer has been created, but the outer chamfer has been omitted. The inner chamfer has been created, and the outer one has been. So you can have these architectural requirements, uh, and by the same folded plate command, which normally doesn't do these kinds of things. Uh, you can create walls of uh, this kind of um, variety. Another thing which is very useful is that you can uh, actually, normally in a folded plate command, the thickness is constant across across the wall. But I can ask it to do a thickness of 500 millimeters for the first leg, 1000 millimeters for the second leg, and back to 500 for the remaining legs. And when I do that, you can see that it starts off with a thickness of 500. Turns it turns into a thickness of one millimeter, back to 500 for the rest of the for the remaining legs, and I can just go back in and even say that do that only for the third leg, and from then on just really make it a really thick wall of 1.5 meters, and uh, immediately on the screen you see that you've got this variable uh, thickness wall created by the same um, uh, folded plate command which which can also be used for steel structures. But over here uh, with concrete structures, these kinds of walls uh, are not necessarily very uncommon. You can, you can find them and whenever you do, it's very easy for uh, you to model them in Comosis. Now, just like we saw that uh, how easy it is to create holes and then modify those holes or multiply them in the form of a grid. Uh, similarly, in industrial buildings, uh, pits are also very common. Which is that uh, when in a slab you have a you have an opening which then converts into a little pit over there and there's a there's a bottom slab which is lower than that slab and there are four walls around it and uh, that takes up a lot of modeling time for uh, most people uh, so in Comasis what you have done is we provided a direct command for that so all you need to do is just select the slab and select the point and immediately a pit is created as you can see on the screen. And you can see that it has the four walls around the pit and the slab uh, which forms the bottom of the pit. And if you double click on any of those members, you can do complete uh, any kind of modification regarding the depth, the bottom level. You can create multiple pits at the same time. Uh, all these parameters which you see on the screen, you can change the size of the hole. Now, normally, uh, in, uh, typically a detailer would first create a hole, then create the four walls, then create the bottom slab. And if there's a revision uh, regarding the heights or anything, then everything would need to be changed. But in Comosis, it's very easy to just do that. And you can also, once again, you have your chamfer parameters and your other uh, geometrical parameters to play with. You can even create a, a circular opening if you wanted to. And you can create the walls as divided walls or as one single. That would depend on how you want to number them. Now let's quickly select the bottom floor columns. Press Enter. Select our profiles through on-the-fly filtering. Double click. And once we get the columns, we can move them, move the bottom to two meters below the zero level, and the top can remain the same for the ground floors. And all the columns by this single motion will be moved uh, two meters down. We can once again move the walls as well. We can give these a uh, level of minus 2000 as well. Same for the side on the other side. And once we are done with that, we can go to our simple pad footing command and select the column. And the pad footing is created. We can select the pad footing, copy array. And in, this, in the same way we did with the columns, we can just co copy the uh, pad footings. 
and in, in a few clicks we've gotten the foundation system ready uh, almost as well now with a with a few clicks we can create our tie beams between these pad footings for example like that just by selecting the two the two pad footings and then uh, copy that with the array command as well and if we just press copy they will be copied uh, in that direction and then we can continue uh, for the other direction as well we can create a tie beam between these two select it and do the array copy but this time we do four copies in the x direction and three copies in the y direction um, and we just say copy and with a few clicks we've gotten the tie beam system uh, ready as well now as you can probably tell by now uh, modeling in Commosis is quite easy and i'm going to continue doing that for example uh, let's model a few stairs i'm going to select a few points right click and once again select a few points and right click and as you can see it's uh, it's not that difficult if i just uh, double click and do some modifications uh, it you can see on i'm doing it as you can, as you're seeing it on the screen with a few clicks you can create uh, the staircases as well and now then you can copy them to the other floor for example let's now uh, copy them five meters above and we get the second floor as well so um, with a few clicks like like you saw on the screen you are able to create your staircases and then connect them to the beams and the columns and uh, as you're doing it the model is being created and what i mean by that is that uh, if you notice right now all these are separate pieces they're not monolithic but what commosis does automatically is it converts them into a monolithic piece of uh, reinforced concrete um, uh, so it, it becomes one piece when it comes to the drawings and if you notice right now I, have, I haven't given any detail to the clashes everything is clashing with everything this beam is going inside the column this staircase landing is going inside the beam the slab is going inside the, the, the beams, the walls are going through the beams and uh, whatever. So there's a lot of clashes going on right now, but all those clashes will be sorted out once we go to the drawings. So if I was, suppose if I was to go to the drawing side right now uh, and open um, an, a, a drawing, which is basically I had created some views, but the views were empty because I, had, I didn't have any model, but now the views have been filled up because I was doing the model modeling in front of you. So I, as you can see, uh, everything has become monolithic and has become one piece on the drawing side. And we'll talk a lot about this uh, later on. But I just wanted to show show you that as we are doing the modeling, uh, as we are doing the modeling, we the everything is being connected and uh, it's becoming one monolithic piece uh, in concrete. So this is a section taken there. You can see the stairs. Uh, I have the section over here. If I move the section from here, uh, if I take it from here to some other other location immediately that section over there will be modified according to the new location and basically the point being that the drawings are completely connected uh, with the model they have not been dimensioned yet they haven't been annotated yet we'll talk about that but uh, at this point what i want you to notice is that it has become one monolithic piece what was many many uh, small pieces or many individual pieces on on the model side now um, i've been emphasizing throughout the webinar that uh, if you want to do 3d modeling you have to do it completely you can't do it partially and everything needs to be modeled and once again in concrete also uh, the steel industry is fairly used to this but the concrete concrete industry unfortunately is not and what they do is they typically try to model as much as they can and then they switch programs and they move on to autocad and finish the job in AutoCAD, but this is not the right way to do it, and Commosis will encourage you not to do that. And uh, so, for example, one thing which you might notice is incomplete right now is the is the lean concrete under the foundations, which needs to be poured. And you might be thinking, oh, that's going to take a lot, a lot of time. There's so many foundations and tie beams, all of will, all of which will need lean concrete under them. But I'll just show you how quickly it can be done. You just select this bottom area, press Enter. Press the plates and all the you can group them in different ways. Uh, I have selected the tie beams and the single footings like that. And after having done that, let's just go to this lean concrete command over here and just press it. And the moment you do that, just look what happened. These pink lean concretes have been modeled under the foundations with a single click. This would have taken you hours and hours to do, maybe. But with a single click, 
all the lean concrete has been modeled and now that it's been modeled it's going to show up in the drawings as well and it's going to show up not uh, in uh, this is not going to be unioned with the main cast in place concrete this is going to be a separate union it's going to turn up as a separate object and there'll be a line over here normally if, for example if it was if it was all going to be union they would uh, they would merge into one piece but in this case the program intelligently knows that the lean concrete is a separate object and we will see the results of that uh, later anyways but what what i wanted to show you is how quickly and how efficiently uh, commerce will help you within a uh, with uh, literally in a few seconds model your lean concrete now let's talk about drains and channels which are very common in um, concrete industrial buildings and uh, they're used for different purposes and there would be a drain going uh, along a slab for example collecting some fluids or uh, draining them out for whatever reasons and they're usually very difficult to model with cuts uh, because of their shapes and the way they're so in commosis what we have are specialized commands specialized cut commands so let me just select this slab and right click and then let me just show it a path it's going to select a few points point number one two three let's go like that let's go to the mid let's come back over here and let's go out from there and then right click now the moment i do that you see on the screen that this channel let me just close the cut so that you can see it better and yeah so you can see that this channel has been created all along that path which i showed with a with, with a few clicks uh, just by selecting the points and normally if you if you were to do this by using the normal cut commands present in a typical uh, commercially available softwares then uh, this would this would be pretty time time consuming and this is not all uh, if i were to just double click on um, or open up the cut for example and double click on that you would see that there's a lot more uh, going on over here. For instance, I've got control over the thicknesses of these or the widths of these channels. So I can uh, enter 500, for example, and if I press apply, the, ch the width of the channel changes. But I can also press 500 and uh, say 1000 and then go back to 500. And in that case, the the second part the second leg of the channel has a width of one meter and then the rest go back to 500 so this gives me a, even more control over what i can do with uh, with the command another thing which i can do is i can turn on these little boxes over here and when i do that the ends have been modified if you can see so this is this kind of a detail is pretty common and wherever it's pouring into the final uh, the final detail could be something like that so imagine doing that by using the classical cut commands uh, in commerce that would take you a long time but the presence of the, such dedicated cut commands will really make your uh, job a lot easier another thing which i can do is i can give chamfers so this was point number one this was point number two so i can go to my point number two and give it a chamfer of say uh, 1000 by 1000 and if i do that you see that this chamfer is created uh, over and above my original uh, definition there is even more i can do with it here i have complete control over the inner chamfer and the outer chamfer so if i want i can ask the program not to create the outer chamfer and if i do that you see that the outer chamfer has not been created but the inner chamfer has been created and this is something which might be the requirement of your particular uh, design requ requirement. So this is, as you can see, this creating these kinds of cuts, while it's possible to do them using the normal cut commands as well, but having the uh, having commands, dedicated commands like this, would really make your um, job as a detailer much, much easier. Uh, here is another trick which you can do with this very same macro. If I, uh, you, you can use this little checkbox over here, to create the covers that we've been talking about. So if I turn this on, for example, and I press OK, uh, and I turn off the, um, the cuts, you can see that Comosis has created covers for the entire drain uh, all along the way. And these are customizable, and you can modify their locations and the types of handles and this and that. There's a lot of detail, which I can't go into right now. But the point being that with a single command, just by selecting 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you have created a very complex detail 
uh, which uh, then uh, allows you to um, go directly to the to the drawing side and create the draw create the drawings automatically from this model instead of taking it to AutoCAD and finishing it off in AutoCAD for details such as these such as these galleries are very common in industrial plants and these could be underground galleries or overground galleries uh, depending on uh, the situation and they're typically used to carry uh, pipes or electrical cables from one point to to the other uh, across the plant and uh, you have this is what they typically would look like uh, so let me uh, set the origin of interest somewhere over here and so, so it, it's basically a gallery and you've got you what you have is you've got you have these uh, cable raceways or pipe supports coming from the sides of the walls on which the pipes or the cables uh, actually eventually run now creating this of course uh, is slightly time consuming depending on on the geometry but in commosis let me just delete this one which you see on the screen and we i'll show you this dedicated command for galleries all you need to do is just select Point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, uh, point 0.4, and right-click, and your gallery is uh, created. If you if you double-click on on the gallery, uh, you have complete control once again. You can you can create you can modify the thickness uh, this this uh, width of the gallery. For example, so if I wanted the width of one meter, but then I wanted the second one to be two meters, and then back to one meter, then I could just do that like that, and immediately. This is one meters. This is two. Let me just increase that a bit more so that it becomes more pronounced. Let's make it three meters. Yeah, so you can see it better on the screen now. Uh, so the the gallery has widened in that area and then it's narrowed once again. So this kind of control you have from there, uh, you can obviously change the the points on around which it's anchored uh, from those uh, parameters using those parameters you have complete geometric control as you see over the size of the gallery etc you even have these starting uh, the widening of the gallery at the start at the end options to do that it's it's very easy to see that doing this manually with uh, five or six wall commands will be time consuming so for example if i were to go to the properties uh, to, uh, section or to the uh, to the properties section and go to the chamfer part over here i can say that give my point number two uh, chamfer of 5000 5000 and uh, this you, you can give this inside part a chamfer so so sometimes you have this issue of uh, the, the the pipes or the cables cannot turn that easily to through sharp corners so you need to give them uh, some sort of a chamfer for them to turn so it's very easy to just can just create this and the reason why i'm showing all this to you is to, uh, to remove the fear which most people have of industrial plant uh, concrete modeling. Uh, they think it's gonna take a lot of time, but from what you're seeing on the screen, it's pretty obvious that um, with Comosis, you can very quickly go through the modeling of the concrete. Another example which uh, emphasizes the fact that we should model everything and not leave anything out of the 3D model is the excavation. Normally, when people do 3D modeling, what they tend to do is they tend to model the main structure, then they get the drawings from that. But since they haven't uh, modeled the excavation around the structure, and these, this excavation a lot of times needs to be shown uh, on the drawings, so what they do is they will uh, they will continue in AutoCAD and uh, finish off the excavation-related uh, information with, with AutoCAD. But then once they start getting revisions, then they have problems. So in Comosis, we don't recommend that. So let's go to the excavation macro. It asks for the bottom level. So let me just say DZ minus 2600. If you remember, the bottom level of the foundation was 2500. But then we added the lean concrete. So that's the bottom level now. And then it basically asks me to go around the perimeter of the structure. So I'll just go around these uh, main points and finish it off and when i do that it creates this uh, excavation uh, model and let me just double click on that and um, add this increase the size a bit so that it goes or maybe uh, it needs to be a bit more than that yeah this is better uh, and let me just rotate this and show you what it's done it's created this uh, hypothetical model of the excavation and you can further model this in much more detail i'm just going to show you what the results would be let me go to the drawings for example 
And as you can see in the drawings, that excavation now exists as part of the, the model. And now we can give uh, you know levels over here. This is plus uh, plus minus zero level. This is minus uh, minus 2,600 and stuff like that. But the point is that because we've modeled it now, uh, because we've modeled it now, we don't need to go to any other software and finish it off over there. We can continue working in Commosis, and that is the basic rule of of 3D modeling that we should not leave anything out. And once again, what I just showed you was probably the simplest model that could have been made. Here is a much more complicated model of excavation, and you can see that the entire excavation is this is multi-level excavation from here to here, then further down, then further down, and other slopes have been given. It has all been modeled, and uh, a separate drawing has been created just to just to show the the way the excavation is going to be done at the site. And this feature then becomes extremely useful because uh, not only can you show the details of the concrete, but you can also show the details of the excavation uh, for the people at the site, and you can provide 3D views of the excavation as well, which also uh, makes the, their job a lot a lot easier. Now, of course, in real life. Um, concrete can be a lot more com complex uh, than merely beams and columns and walls and slabs and you can get very complicated shapes and that's the beauty of concrete as well but your modeling programs uh, need to be able to handle those shapes as well so we have in Commosis all these generic uh, primitives so we have like boxes or cylinders or cones or pyramids or spheres or toruses or uh, so let me talk about the tapered solid which is interesting so let me just go over. All you need to do is basically just select a closed loop and it will create a tapered solid for you. And then if you double click on that, you can give it a height. And let's give it a height of 5 meters. And uh, once you enter it, the box is created. But then you can go on and give it a taper of, say, 11 degrees. And from all sides, it's going to be tapered inwards to uh, 11 degrees. You can give it minus 11 as well or whatever number. But what you can do more than that is actually say, okay, the first line would be um, 11 degrees, but after that, I want 20 degrees. So you can have, get an even more complicated tapered solid if you want. This uh, really makes it quite convenient. But more than that, we have uh, other very interesting features as well. Let me delete this one. And let's go to the extrusion feature. So you, have, you can have, for example, uh, retaining walls with this kind of a cross-section or any, anything else as well. And what you can do is you can create these by using this, this polygon command, and you can even put holes inside them if you want. Uh, but what I'm going to show you over here is that you can use the extrusion feature to select this cross-section and select a path. And as you can see, the path is curved. It has chamfers as well. And the moment I do that, a uh, retaining wall is is created, uh, extruded along that path. And this kind of uh, capability can then be used to model these co complex uh, shapes in concrete. And then you can go to the 2D, 2D drawings and it will be unioned and it will be uh, unioned with all the other beams and columns or whatever you have in your structure. And it will become one monolithic uh, element. Uh, let's do a slightly different example. So maybe you have a ribbed uh, concrete roof. Uh, in which the this is the cross section of the concrete and this is the shape of the roof once again you can go to your extrusion command and you can say i want this cross section of concrete to go uh, to follow this roof curve and immediately your uh, ribbed roof and can be created and then you can continue with your beams and columns around it like i said they can clash as well uh, that's going to be okay uh, the union uh, the union feature in commosis doesn't really care about that it manages to create a monolithic solid on the drawing side uh, beyond your extrusion, which is very powerful, like I said, you can even have holes in your cross section and uh, extrude them. Uh, but beyond that, you have surfaces of revolution. So, for example, I have this um, cross section over here and I want to revolve it around itself 360 degrees. I just go to the surface of revolution command, select that, and select an axis of revolution. And the moment I do that, a surface of revolution is created. So these are very powerful features. Like I said, you have the primitives, you have the tapered solids, but you also have these extrusions and surfaces of revolution. And basically with these, um, the sky is the limit and you can model practically anything uh, under the sun, which, uh, which your complex project might require. And you can be uh, assured that the drawings will uh, come out very neat and clean according to that. Now let's talk about embedded steel. 
And the modeling of embedded steel is um, actually quite important. Uh, and sometimes companies don't do that and they prefer to do it in AutoCAD and that's because they don't have the, and the nice and, and good tools to do the modeling quickly. Uh, but it's very important to have it modeled because uh, once you have it in there, then you can see any clashes with the rebars and stuff like that. And also your the general quality and all your bill of quantities and all those will be much more accurate. And uh, don't take it lightly because it's not embedded steel is not like five or ten or fifteen pieces. You can have projects with uh, hundreds and or thousands of uh, embedded steel places, uh, embedded steel placed in your uh, in your concrete. We just did um, a project in, uh, on Kamosis recently in which the number of embedded steel plates uh, was over uh, over a hundred thousand. Uh, so you can well imagine what what kind of uh, pressure that would put on on somebody who's doing that kind of stuff with with AutoCAD. So how do we actually model embedded steel in, in Comasis? Well, it's very simple. All you do is you just set your work plane to the surface on which your embedded steel will uh, eventually be located, and then if you've got the location of the embedded steel uh, on that surface, or you can or any snappable point, all you do is just go to your embedded steel command, select the origin, and select an X direction. You could have an incline direction as well. You can select any direction basically for the X uh, axis. And the moment you do that, you can right click, and your embedded steel will be created immediately on that uh, at that point. Now let's go inside the wall and see what it looks like from the inside. And I've opened the dialog box for the macro which created it. And as you can see, we've got so many options for the anchor bars. These are the ones you're seeing on the screen right now, even for anchor bolt placement, or uh, like I said, the anchor bar placement, or shear keys if you want to place shear keys behind them, or if you want to place rag bolts. So, all sorts of um, options. Let me go back to the anchor bar one. And over here, you see that you can, you have the choice of U type, or you can choose an RB type, for example, which is a different. You can change the angles uh, of how they will be sticking out. You can go to the L type, for example, and you can once again give different angles. Uh, or or and you you can also choose from uh, these company databases. So, for example, if I choose uh, this one over here, it will be a different one. And if I choose for different materials, you can have different ones. So let me go back to uh, to the project pre to the preferences file folder over here, and go to the anchor bars, for example. And over here, you can see that you can you can set up your company standards for the different types of bars at the back. And for each one, you can even have axial capacities of how much tensile forces they can resist. And then that'll be a quick reminder for you when you're designing the embedded steel. So it's very uh, general the way it has been set up like i said you can uh, you can have all sorts of combinations of your um, bars and you, even after you t you pull them from your company database you can still go ahead go ahead and modify them for a particular project so this one has been has a, a length of 600 millimeters but i don't want it that long so i can modify it there on the fly and i can i can create a custom one there and then and like i said you can always in commerce save them away as your company presets so if I wanted a 16 anchor uh, 16 anchor bolts instead, I would just uh, load that, and my anchor bolts would be prepared. If I wanted uh, four anchor bolts, you know, I can I can give them different names uh, and save them away for later use. If I wanted four rag bolts, for example, I could just uh, call in the rag bolt option. If I wanted the uh, set four tension bars along with two shear keys, I could uh, you know have that uh, as my uh, as my embedded steel so these options are very powerful you can you can save hundreds of different types away uh, or however however many you uh, use in your company and once you've had once you have them saved away which is very easy not time consuming at all you can very quickly go through all you need is just, all you need to do is just select points like, like i just showed you you put your work plane on the wall or on the on the slab or on the inclined wall or whatever where, wherever it is that you're working and you just basically uh, point and shoot and it's as, as simple as that. And this is important, the fact that you can model embedded steel so quickly and so easily, because people avoid concrete uh, 3D modeling because of things like this, because they find it too difficult or too time consuming to do uh, modeling of this sort. But with Comosis, 
all these little things which add up if you look at the whole picture they have been put together in a, in a very nice and convenient way and uh, the moment you're you're trained to do it basically it doesn't take much time at all one thing worth noting is that while we have a lot of control over the over the objects created by the embedded steel we can have we have complete control over the way the grid will be set out and the distances between these bars and all that uh, but whatever bar you choose, so for example, if we have uh, whatever eight, ten bars over here, they'll all be the same from within the macro. But from outside the macro, you actually have individual control on every one of those bars. So I can just double click on any particular bar and, and I say this particular one I want to be of a length of 100. And that particular one will be shorter and maybe I can do the same to uh, this one as well uh, or the top two. So I can modify. Uh, the exact the, uh, exactly according to what my requirements are uh, even if the macro doesn't really uh, allow that because i have individual control over the over the over the uh, embedded elements once the macro is, has been done with them and of course like uh, with everything in commosis if you were really pushed you can do manual detailing and you can create any kind of a, uh, of an embedded steel which you wanted we've done this is a very simple one I remember doing an embedded steel which looked like a like a, a half a building because it was carrying almost uh, 3,000 tons of uh, tension. Uh, it was a huge bridge uh, related project. But what I mean to say is that you can you can basically model anything you want uh, inside Commosus. Now there's a lot I haven't shown you yet, but we don't have time, so I'll have to just move on. So, for example, I haven't talked about how to create grout or how to create surface slopes if the slope is not, if the surface is not, uh, uh, if the surface has a slope, for example, how to create water stoppers, how to create individual covers if you needed to, how to create those hundreds of anchor bolt cutouts, which we saw in some of the models, maybe how to create flares. And I mean, there's a lot I haven't shown you, piles, for example, uh, but you get the idea. The, the point is that. Uh, you have to complete your model. The grout is important. The surface slope is important. If you don't do that, you will end up finishing your drawings in AutoCAD. You will start off in some 3D software, modeling software, but you will end up in AutoCAD. And that's that's where you that's where you fall. That's where you make a mistake, and that's why uh, your company never really gets going as far as concrete uh, modeling is concerned. Because half the stuff is done in in a, in a 3D modeling software, and the other half uh, there might be minor things, but the fact is that they're not minor in this, uh, because whenever there are revisions, you need to go back to the same 2D drawings and AutoCAD. And once you start doing that, like I've mentioned earlier as well, you basically uh, lose the game. It's, it's not the way you're supposed to do 3D modeling. So the reason why I'm just going through these things one by one is to show you how uh, and why Commosus will allow you to actually finish the model even when you have complicated uh, industrial plants which uh, need to be modeled. Now I want to say a few words about general arrangement drawings in Commosus and uh, what kind of things are involved in creating general arrangement drawings. So you saw me uh, create most of this building. I, uh, I've, I've just copied these floor slabs everywhere. That, that took hardly took a few minutes. Uh, on all the floors and I've also created some uh, anchor bolt cutouts on the first floor uh, just to just to give it some sort of a variation for the drawings uh, and now I'm going to go to the drawing side so I press on this double uh, double click on that go to my drawing manager and open up my uh, general arrangement drawing in which I have imported the uh, some of the views not all I've imported the 3D view, I've imported the ground level, uh, zero level view over there. Uh, I've imported the 5,000 millimeter uh, floor level where I have those cutouts, as you can see, the anchor bolt cutouts and these pits on ev in, ev in every slab. And there's a section uh, as well over there. Now, importing these, these views into the drawing is uh, hardly takes uh, a, a few minutes, not even that. All you do is you just Impo uh, see the the list on the left hand side of all your model views and you can just right click and say create viewport and the uh, the view will be created so that's hardly time consuming what can take some time is the annotation 
of these elements and the uh, dimensioning of these elements. And I want to just take you through uh, the steps of doing this uh, because it's not that difficult at all. And uh, if, if needed, you can always make some manual modifications. So let's go through the dimensioning step first. Let me just, what you do is you basically select any viewport and you, you go to this command, which is the linear dimensioning command for that viewport, for a particular viewport, and you just press it. And the moment you do it, the dimensions for that, for the, for the form work, for the concrete, of that um, viewport are created uh, for you. And they're not even repeated for, so for example, this one is the same as this one is the same as this one. So it doesn't repeat them again and again in, in the inside. At this particular one being a bigger dimension, a bigger uh, foundation, it would have gotten a separate dimension. Now you can do the same on, on this viewport. Just go there and press the command again. Uh, you can go to this section over here and pre press the command again and your dimensions will be uh, created. Now, what you can also do is uh, select individual elements like these anchor board cutouts and press the same command again, and uh, they will be dimensioned uh, there and then in front of you. Uh, another thing which you can do is press the level indicators symbol over here. So just select the, the viewport and press level indicator, and your level indicators will be, will be created on each, uh, wherever the level is changing. Wherever you have a new level, you will get your your level indicators, and then you can move them around if you if if you wish to. So by doing that, or for example, if you do do that in the plan view, for example, you will get uh, level indicators like this uh, in the plan view, and you can you can put them any way you want. If there are different um, different uh, levels, then all of them will be dimensioned. So dimension the dimensioning, as you can see, is pretty fast, and you can always go and manually modify it if you want. But it's pretty clean uh, as well. The next thing which you want on these drawings is the annotation. So you want to see what, what each the, uh, the the assembly mark of each beam and column uh, and slab and this and that in the in the sections and in the uh, in the plan views etc. And once again, you can do that individually. You can select pieces individually and you can you can mark them. And there are very specialized commands for creating all sorts of annota annotations. But you can also uh, do that pretty quickly. But once again, like we did in the dimensioning. Uh, of the viewports, we can select the viewport and we can uh, auto annotate the viewport as well. So when I do that, for example, uh, in a few minutes, it's going to find uh, places for for the annotations. So it has found places for the slabs and for the uh, for the pits and for the beams, uh, or for the columns. Uh, it has found places which are not uh, clashing with each other. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty clean. Uh, there's not much uh, to be modified over there. I can come to this side and press, select this one and press the same auto um, viewport button again. And once again, my beams and my columns and my uh, slabs are all uh, annotated. Obviously, this will depend on my numbering options and the way I, and my selection as well, and my settings. Right now, I haven't really checked the settings, but what what I'm trying to show you basically is that you just select the viewport and you select auto annotate and you select the viewport and you select uh, auto dimension and you get uh, reasonable results because these are, these are general arrangement drawings they're not assembly drawings but you get a lot of the dimensions which you will need and then you can finalize them after uh, if you see something missing or uh, if you see something needs to be done in a in a different way now you might be thinking that i've showed you a fairly simple building and gone through the commands, but I've promised you that any kind of an industrial structure can be done. So here is a little example of uh, not that complicated, but reasonably uh, complicated structure, where this is a water intake structure, uh, which is um, which has been modeled entirely with the commands that I've showed you. As you can see, all the, the holes in the slabs and the depressions and the anchor board cutouts and the covers and over here, for example, we have a very unique feature in which this part of the concrete, uh, let me just hide this. So you can see that this huge water uh, intake uh, water pipe was there and this pipe itself became the formwork for the, for the concrete poured around it. Um, and let me hide the, yeah, so you can see on the screen that very complicated things can be done uh, with commosses very easily. What you see on the screen was uh, hardly, uh, hardly took a few days to do uh, as far as the concrete is concerned. 
and uh, all the commands which I've just showed you uh, went into the detailing of uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now. And uh, once you have the, the model ready, you can immediately go uh, to the drawings and create your plans and your sections and uh, 3D uh, drawings and whatnot. And from once you're done with that, then you can continue with the with the rebar detailing. So here is another example of complicated structures. These are examples of the hundreds and thousands of embedded steel which I was talking about. Uh, this is a cement uh, plant, and uh, here we see a combination of steel and concrete together. So I mean, it's 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 pretty clear that uh, Commerces is not limited to the kind of building um, classical just beams and columns type of structures that uh, we typically show in uh, in the webinars just because of time constraints. But anything of this sort, any complicated uh, structure can easily be uh, modeled uh, within Commerces. Here we are inside the concrete. And as you can see, the rebars uh, have been modeled in 3D. And there's a lot of rebar in there. This is a huge structure. But it's so easily uh, being done, and you can uh, see the beautiful results on the screen. And once you get used to this kind of modeling, and once you get used to 3D modeling of rebars and and concrete, you you will you will not look back. You will not go. You will not want to go back to the classical uh, 2D AutoCAD methods. How about this for complexity? This is the foundation of a continuous casting machine, which is. Uh, used in steel plants and this is a huge machine and it, uh, all these are points where the machine is sitting on the concrete and uh, it has to be modeled extremely carefully as you can see there are there are lots of uh, these little stubs coming out anchor bolt holes other types of uh, depressions changes in geometry all these uh, drainage uh, channels uh, and what what you're seeing is one of the most complicated types of equipment foundations you will you will ever do. And this was done entirely in Commosis and in, in record time, much faster than the AutoCAD uh, um, statistics which we had from, uh, from the past. And uh, this is truly uh, something to, to think about. If you, can, if you can model something like this and put rebar in it and uh, take plans and take sections and um, get your material lists, and your material takeoffs, everything from this this model, then there's there is practically nothing uh, which you which you can't do. This is this should be this should be this should, this should suffice to um, to basically convince anyone that uh, whatever they're doing in in concrete, whatever however difficult of a structure they're doing in concrete, they should not worry and they should immediately switch to to three D modeling. And you might be thinking that. Show me the drawings which you which you have extracted from those complicated 3D models. So what you see on the screen is uh, is Commosis once again. These are drawings taken from those models, and you can see the quality uh, of the drawings. They're very clean, and um, they they can easily um, depict or show or uh, put in the form of a 2D drawing any complicated uh, structure which you can model. Uh, inside Commosis. Here is a sectional view from the same structure which we just saw. And as you can see, it's very clean. It's very, uh, the, the, the section has been taken properly. And you can obviously modify the points from which you want to take the sections. And once you have the section, you can just go over it extremely quickly with some automatic dimensioning commands, which I will show as well. Here is another section where you can see those inclined uh, drains as well, extending extending in the Z direction. And here we see them for, with a shorter depth, with a lesser depth, so we can just see a part of it. As you can see, these are all uh, automatic sections taken from the model, and they really bring down your work. Otherwise, for each section, if you're doing it in AutoCAD, you would have to work half a day to create these sections and they would still not be accurate but once you have the 3d model then the generation of plans and sections is really uh, very easy here we see another section from a different uh, area in the uh, in, in that ccm machine foundation you can see the quality of the drawing 
And this will give you an idea that what we are talking about is not just those simple buildings with beams and columns uh, in which you can produce uh, sections and plans very easily. These are really complicated structures and uh, they really bring down your man hours tremendously. To make the people at the site understand the concrete better, you can even have 3D sections. You can create sectional views from the 3D model and show them to the people at the site and they will understand exactly how they need to pour the concrete. Here you see another 3D section. And over here you see several sections taken in the same drawing. Over here you see those hundreds of uh, anchor bolt cutouts which are very common in equipment foundations and they've been dimensioned and very cleanly and you can see uh, how um, a beautiful drawing like this can really improve your quality, uh, your brand name and also with along with the 3D images and the 3D sections which I just showed you can really um, take the level of your company uh, several notches above. Now let's move on to rebars. It's interesting how well established the steel industry is in 3D modeling and how lagging and far behind the concrete and rebar modeling industries are. Now part of it probably has to do with the fact that steel softwares were developed earlier and got a head start. But as things stand today, there is really no excuse left for the concrete industry to stay behind. My purpose in this part of the webinar is to create some confidence in those who haven't stepped into the world of 3D rebar modeling yet. Those who have will hopefully also like what I will show, but I'm more focused on those who haven't. I hope that owners of businesses will watch this webinar later and will start believing their companies can actually make some money out of it if they switch today. There will be a few hiccups, there always are, but that's the job of visionaries. They are the ones who keep pushing despite all the naysayers and eventually take everyone with them to a higher level. Change will need to come from the top. Change will need to come from the visionaries. Now let's start modeling rebar together. Watch me show you how easy it can be. I'm a firm believer that the best modelers are the ones who can work fast, even without macros. Obviously not as fast as with macros, but fast enough to get the work done faster than the classical 2D AutoCAD techniques. So follow me and imagine you are doing it. When you start believing is when it will happen for you. It's a bit like the matrix. So let's start with the absolute basics. Here on the screen, you see a, a small slab. It's uh, pretty simple. And we want to put some rebar uh, in this slab. Now over here in the concrete menu, we have this rebar uh, command over here. One to create a rebar group and one to create a single rebar. Let's go with the rebar group. And once we do that, it asks us to select a parent object, which is the slab. I select that, then it asks for the shape of the rebar. So I'm gonna put a rebar like that. So I'm gonna say this point, basically I'm using the concrete itself as the um, uh, snappable element, this point and this point over here. And then I, once I'm done with the shape of the rebar, I right click. So the, the rebar shape was like this, like this, like this. And now it's asking me for the range where it will go. So I show at this point and I show at the other point of the slab. And then it asks me for uh, a Y direction, but I don't need to enter that. So I just right click. And the moment I do that, immediately rebars are created um, on the screen. Now at the moment, there is no clear cover as you can see on the screen. So all I need to do is just double click on the bar. And in this clear cover section, if I, I can give it a clear cover of 50 millimeters, for example, and immediately you see that my rebar has been provided with a clear cover of 50 uh, millimeters. But right now, the ends are still touching the bottom of the slab, and I don't want that. 
So for that, I just double click again and give it a start offset of 50 millimeters and an end offset of 50 millimeters again. And when I press OK, my start offset and my end offset has all have also been pulled back. Looking at it from the plan view, I see that the range also needs to be pulled back. So I double click on the bar and here I have my range pulled back. So I give it the same 50 millimeters. And my, now my range is also pulled back with a clear cover of 50 millimeters on, on both sides. By the way, you can enter more than one number in this range section. So I can give it a number of 100 millimeters for the start and 50 for the end. And in that case, my start will have a, a pullback of 100 millimeters while the end will remain at 50. The same kind of thing is possible for the clear cover as well. So if I were to open that and say, instead of saying 50, if I said 150, 150, and then 50 again, what that would mean is that my first leg will be pulled back 50 millimeters, the second leg will be pulled back 150, and the third leg back to 50. I can do the same thing with a minus sign as well. If I put in minus 150 over there, my second leg will be pulled out of the concrete. Now, when I select a rebar, this little gray uh, button appears over here. And I, instead of double clicking on it and opening up the entire dialog box, which is complicated, what I can do is I can select the rebar and just press on this gray button, which appears. And I get this little box over there, which gives me the most frequently used uh, options. So for example, I can uh, open up the hooks at the start or the hooks at the end, turn them back on and off. Obviously the parameters will depend whatever has been set inside. I can go in and change the, uh, the spacing. I just press enter and now the just spacing instead of 250 is 500 millimeters. I can change the type of the rebar. It can be different types. It can be it can be top main, top secondary, bottom main, bottom secondary, longitudinal, intermediate, all, all sorts of options are available over here and you can choose them according to your needs. So that wasn't that difficult, was it? Congratulations. You've just become an official 3D rebar modeler. Well, we know life's not that simple, so let's make it a little more complicated. If I were to double click on this um, bar over here, you see at the top uh, right corner, there's this option of line, uh, linear tapered, straight, general. So it was created as a straight bar when I initially did this. Now, what I can do is I can double click on that and convert it from a straight bar to a linear tapered bar. But before I do that, let me show you something on the screen. When you initially created it, uh, when you select any bar, you see this initial bar path over here. This is the bar path which is going to continue along the range. It's, there's only one bar path. But if I were to double click on it and convert it from straight to linear taper, then a second bar path appears at the end this blue one. So there's one at the beginning and one at the end. Now, what can I do with this? What I can do with it is I can select the, the segments of any one of these. So let's select this one and give it a move, let's say, of a few thousand millimeters. And immediately what you see on the screen is that your bar has become a tapered bar uh, from the start to the end. And that's that was very convenient. I can do that with the edge with a segment at the other, other end as well. I can go and I can make it move inwards as well. It's a linear tapered bar now, but there's more. What I can do is I can select these and at the end path, instead of selecting the whole segment, I can select this bottom point only, or I can uh, select it like that, I'm sorry. Yes, like that. And I can actually make it go up if I wanted to, say 50 millimeters. And when I do that, what's happening is that the end, the end bar is moving, but the first bar is still there and there's linear interpolation between the two points. I can do the same at the other side as well. I can select this one and I can move it, say um, 550 up, or let's make it 1000 up and see what happens. And now we've got a strange situation in which it starts off like that and it tapers up in that direction. 
So we've got a lot of control in this, if you, if you notice. The moment I select them, I've got a starting path and I've got an ending path. And by moving those ending path segments or points, I can basically create a very complicated bar in a few seconds. But life can be even more complicated. So let's double click on the bar again. And from linear tapered, let's convert it into a circular taper and press OK. Now, in this case, you see you have three paths to play with. One in the, at the beginning, one at the middle, and one at the end. And just like I did with the linear taper by moving the path segments, what if I move this segment, once again, some number like that, and now what you see is that instead of a linear taper, we're getting a circular uh, variation in that uh, on the, on the left-hand side, uh, depending on what segment you choose. And similarly, I can do the same for the other side as well. I can press the same buttons and I can get my circularly tapered bars. Well, congratulations again. Now you're an advanced 3D rebar modeler. You want to become even more advanced? Let's select the middle one and let's select the stop segment for a change and move it up, for example. What do we have here? Well, that's interesting. You've got a variation circular like this and circular like that. And I mean, you can see that you can see where I'm trying to get with this, that you've got a lot of control and very easy manipulation methods, just playing with those handles, playing with those segments to create very, very complicated uh, rebar shapes. Let's play around with it a bit more. Let's select the rebars. And let's say you had forgotten a point in the original definition. If you remember, I had defined the bar like that. But what if you had forgotten a point right in the beginning? Well, what you can do is you can select this endpoint. You can zoom in and select this one as well with pressing control. And you can zoom in and press this one as well. And after having selected all three, if you could just say add point, then a vertex is added at the beginning at the start point, and now uh, you have an, an additional definition point in your, uh, in your path. You can do the same by, uh, for example, what you could do is you could add a midpoint over here, and you can say plus, and you could give it, say, a Z direction of 1000, move. And once you do that, you've, got, you've inserted even more points. So you can see very clearly on the screen what's happening. And you're, you're becoming an even more advanced user as I speak. Now, just like we could play with the path points, uh, whatever way we wanted to, we can also play with the range points. So if I were to select this bar, we see that this range line appears over here. And there's, there's a start of the range and there's the end of the range. And the start and the end can be selected. So I've selected the end of the range. And what I can do is I can use these two buttons over here to move the range. So if I press this one, I'm moving it forward. If you notice, it's going forward by one meter and it's going basically, it's basically uh, the, the same point is moving upward. So let me move it a bit more. Now bring it back. And let me do the same thing again now, but with the other command. Let me select the end. And instead of using this one, I'll use this range extension. And when I use this one, then instead of this point moving upward, it will move along this taper. So let me do that. And now you can see that it is moving along that taper. And both of them can be required depending on what your needs are. Let's play a bit more with the rebars. So let me select this one over here and select this segment. And over here, I have the option of breaking this segment. So up till now, we've moved the points or the edges around, but I'm, I'm gonna actually break the path. So I go to the break path and it asks me for a point where I want to break it. So I could just select the midpoint over here, for example. And when I do that, immediately the bars are divided into two bars. So there's one going from here to here and the other one going the rest of the way. And now what I can do is I can just move this one, for example, say 20 millimeters in the Y direction. And then what I can do is I can select this endpoint and give it a move of say minus 1000 uh, in the Y direction and there. I've created a little, little splice at that point. Now, just like I could break the path by selecting a segment and then showing it any point, I can actually also break the range. So this one, this bar was, was placed from 
uh, from this, this point to this point as a single ID. What I can do is I can just zoom in and just click on any, any one of these little plus signs. And when I do that, this little option appears and I can tell it to break at that point. What that will do is it will break the range from here to here and then from there to the end. And now what I can do is obviously double click on the, the other part, for example, convert it into a linear taper and then uh, move that part uh, inside maybe. So now I've got this different thing going straight and then moving in. And uh, with a few clicks, I've managed to follow whatever geometry uh, I might have on the uh, in my project. Let's do some more range modifications. So in in uh, with rebars, you're usually when you're looking at rebars from a sectional view, you're either seeing lines or you're seeing dots. This is the most common uh, way of looking at uh, rebars, either lines and dots. And when you're looking at dots, you might want to move them uh, so that, for example, you might want to move these dots right up to this point where they come to this end of this segment just before the radius starts turning. And, you know, you want to do that in a, in a precise way. So all you do is you select that, you select the range handle, and you select this button over here, and you just show it this segment. And the moment you do that, those dots are moved right to the point where they snug, fit snugly just before the radius starts. Sometimes the requirement might be different. You might want these dots to go to move in this direction right up to the point where they're just just beyond this vertical green bar. Uh, and that could be another requirement which you might have. So what you do is uh, you basically select the bar again and you select this range button. You press this and then you select this segment this time and you show it the side where you want it to go. And the bar is immediately placed to the other side of uh, the rebar. So here is another interesting situation. I have a bar going like that, but I want to pull it back inside the concrete along this side, which has been cut at, an, at a tapered angle. So all I do is I select the bars, I select this end point, and I say, give me an extra point. It gives me an extra point in the wrong direction, vertically upwards. So what I do is I select my work plane to a surface, and I select this back surface. So I have my positive y direction going like that. So I then select my bar again, select the point, and I say I want to move it, and I say select distance, I zoom in, I select this point, and then I come over this point, and I say I want to offset this point even further by dy minus 1000. And when I do that, those numbers are filled up, and I can just say move, and my bar has been moved uh, along, along, along this line. From, it, from a vertical position along that line. So that was extremely easy to do. Let me just go from the side and uh, show it to you from side what the final result is. As you can see, this bar which had turned up has now come back along this line a distance of 1000, just the way I wanted. Now, um, let's say you have a rebar is going around the sides of a slab or could be some other example as well. And uh, later on, uh, this the slab was given uh, a chamfer, so let's give it the chamfer. Let's give that plate a chamfer of say 3,000 millimeters, and the plate was modified like that. And your rebars obviously uh, came out like that. So you can give the same chamfer to the rebars as well by selecting these uh, definition points, and you can go to your rebar uh, to the chamfer option. And you have two types of chamfers available. Type 3 and Type 4. In this case, since, we, uh, since the plate has Type 3 chamfer, we can give it the same one. And if we just press Apply, then the rebar can be chamfered. And if you look at it from the plan view, you can see that now it's once again following the shape of the slab. Have I managed to relax you a little? Have I succeeded in um, giving you the confidence that you can do this? giving you the conf confidence that you don't necessarily have to continue with 2D uh, AutoCAD detailing and actually jump into 3D. You've seen how quickly I've been doing this, how fast I've been doing this, and I'm uh, basically using nothing but manual modification commands. What I want you to feel, what I want you to think is that uh, doing it even with without macros is actually faster than doing it in AutoCAD. And if you do have macros, then you can actually go orders of magnitude faster. If you think about it, even the complicated examples are just more of the same. It's just a lot more of what we've done, but it's the same thing repeating itself. 
you keep creating the rebars, you keep modifying the paths, you keep adding uh, new vertices, you keep moving the segments, you keep breaking the path. Basically, it's just more of what we did. You convert it into a linear one or a tapered one or a circular one, and there you go. So what we've shown already, what we've seen already, is quite enough to do, to do even these complicated things which you're seeing on the screen. They're not very different from what we've done. They just look like a jungle, and that's that's scary. But then I'll talk about how you can get rid of that jungle and make it a bit cleaner for yourself as well. But the point is, rebar detailing is not difficult. You can do it. You can do it better than the people are doing their things in the steel industry. So what I want you to go, what I want, uh, the way I want you to leave this webinar today, hopefully, is with a renewed sense of confidence that you can do 3D rebar modeling. I think you're still not convinced. So I'll probably need to show you a bit more. So let's move on. I'm going to show you the sectional reinforcement command, which is a very powerful command, which you can use for a lot of different cases. So I'm going to start with the simpler cases and move on to the more complicated ones. So let us let me go in and select the command. It asks for any object. So I can select this column, for example. Then it asks for a point. So let me just select any point. Let me press the control key and select any point on that column. And the moment I do that, it takes a cross section of that selected element at that point. Now, each one of this is a potential rebar. Or uh, all of them put together or any combination can also be rebars. So if I want all of them, so let's say I want to make a stir up, which will go all around the column. I can, I can just leave everything selected right that and right click. And when I do that, it realizes that this is a closed loop. So it asks me for the point where you want the hook to be. So let me select this point. And then it says, OK, where do you want this to end? So I go up and I go towards the end of the column and I press my control key. And I press enter again and I want my last stirrup to be over here. And when I say right click immediately with the defaults, obviously, the stirrups are created from that point to that point. Let's use the command again to understand it better. Let me go back to the re sectional reinforcement, select the column, select a point, like I said, anywhere, anywhere which is snappable. And now this time, instead of right clicking to tell it to make the complete loop, let me go and select this one, this one, and this one. I don't want to do the complete loop. I just want to do these three sides of the loop and then right click. And this time it doesn't ask me for the point where the hook will be because it's not a closed loop. It just asks me for the final point where I want uh, this bar to end. And this time, as you can see, it brings only the partial bar. And when I do right click, immediately my bars are created uh, with that shape, which was taken from that cross section. Now let's use it on an inclined column. So let's go back into the command, select the column, select a point at near the base. It creates the inclined uh, stirrup. I right click to show it the, where the hook will be. Then it asks for the final point. So I choose this one and I press right click and my stirrups are created at the incline like that. But what if I did not want them to be inclined? What if the, I did not want the stirrups to be like this, but I wanted them to go like that along the global Z direction, not inclined along with the column? What would I do in that case? So let me just press Control Z to undo. And I basically go back in there, back to the same command, go back to my sectional reinforcement, select the column. But as I'm selecting this point, I press the three key. Three, three, three. One is for X, two is for Y, and three is for Z. And three would tell it that I want the direction to be uh, along the three axis, which is the Z global or the current uh, work plane Z axis. So if I press three while selecting this point, it's going to take a cross section, but a uh, the outer unit normal of that cross section will be in the three direction of the local work plane. So I'm fine with that. Let me right click, show the point where uh, the hook will be. Go back in there, select this point while keeping three pressed once again. Right click, and this time it asks for uh, the, another section point. I don't want that. And this time, as you can see, now it has created the stirrups once again, but this time they are parallel to the ground. Now, in the examples I've shown so far, 
were, I have taken a section at two points and the bars have gone from point one to point two. But the shape of the bar has remained constant, whatever the direction may be. But what if we had a tapered column like this? In that case, what would happen? So if I go to my uh, sectional command once again, select my tapered column, select the first point by pressing three because I want them in the global direction. Uh, right click to accept all and let's say put the hook at this point. And then I go up and select this point, press three and right click and right click again. Now, as you can see, uh, the, because of the column has been tapered and because the sections were different at this point and at this point, it has done an interpolation, a linear interpolation from that point to that point. And I've created uh, stirrups which vary in a tapered way. Let's move on to a slightly more complicated cross section, like maybe a retaining wall. And once again, go, go to my sectional command, select that parent, go and select any point. Uh, on that surface, it immediately gives me the cross section at that point. Let's say I only want this bottom bar and I don't want the whole cross section. I, I select the bottom bar and I press right click. And then I, go, I have to go to another point at the end and it, get, it brings me the same bar and I just say right click to create those bars. Now we've created this single bar at the base of this retaining wall. What can we do with it? Let's double click on that and see that we have some embedment options for the start and some embedment options for the end. So if I say uh, put the end to the nearest surface and say apply, this little bar then gets embedded into the retaining wall up till what point? Up till the nearest point where it hits the concrete again. So it will automatically calculate how much I need to go. In this case, it's almost one meter. So when I choose this to nearest surface option, it will basically move in that direction. I can also say by embedment length. And what that is, I can give a multiple of the of the diameter. In this case, the diameter is 10 millimeters. So if I say 30 feet and say apply, it's going to turn up and go about 300 millimeters, depending if that is your embedment length. So if I increase this one to 60 feet, for example, the bar will be moved further. What if I make it uh, 120 feet? What's going to happen then? Is it going to realize the shape of the retaining wall? Because I, as you can see, it, it went up and it hit it hit a wall and then it had to turn and it turned inside towards uh, inside the concrete. If I make it 200 feet, it's going to go further. What if I make it 450 feet? Well, it's going to go all the way and it's going to turn again. So this is an amazing feature in which you can create a single bar inside some concrete and then ask it, give it uh, any embedment length and it's basically going to start, it's going to start turning uh, inside that, um, inside that concrete. Let's put it back to none. What I can also do is I can give it custom angles. So if I give it a custom angle, then now if I, this has a custom angle of 90 and 500. When I apply that, it says turn, what it tells it is to turn 90 degrees and go 500 millimeters. But with this one, I'm I'm not restricted to staying in the concrete. I can just say uh, another 90 degrees, and this time uh, I can go another 500. Let's see what happens if I do that. So it turns outside. I can bring it back in if I want with a minus in there. And then I can actually turn it, if I say 45 degrees and another 500, I can make it turn upwards, or if I do a minus 45 over there, I can make it turn downwards. So uh, with this kind of complete control over the end conditions, I can do the same for th same thing for the other end as well by using these variables over here. I can basically create any sort of bar I want after having uh, this af after having created just one uh, base bar. Now, what if instead of creating the bar at the base uh, of this retaining wall, I had initially created a bar like this by selecting these two segments? and then let it run across the retaining wall. If I double clicked on that, so this in the, in the first one there was a single bar, now I've, I've created the initial bar which looks like this. Now in this case, if I were to give it um, an embedment length of 30 feet at this point, it's gonna, it's gonna turn into the concrete at that angle. If I give it to nearest surface for the other end, it's gonna go and hit the bottom of the concrete. If I give it a bigger embedment length of 120 feet, it's going to turn in, into the concrete once again. 
So as you can see, these are very. This is a very powerful command, which not only allows you to use the uh, use the cross section to create your bar, uh, but then also extend the endpoints uh, into whatever embedment lengths which you might be needing. Now let's make you a really advanced 3D rebar modeler, so you can go back home with the certificate. So let's go back to my sectional um, reinforcement command. I select this uh, strange-looking structure. It could be anything. But the thing is that these are uh, these are uh, complicated circular paths um, which have been created. And let me select that and let me take a section by pressing the three buttons so it goes in the positive Z direction. So I'll expect I'll um, accept the complete loop and give this point to be the hook point. Then I go to somewhere near the top, press three, press that, accept it, right click. And my rebars are created on the screen. And as you know, what this command does is it, it takes the first cross section and it takes the last cross section and it does a linear interpolation between the two. But what I can do now is I can double click on this. And inside, if you see over here, there's an option of take a section at every spacing, which means that at every bar spacing, I'm, I'm telling it to recalculate the section rather than doing a linear interpolation. So if I press that and I press OK, then lo and behold, there's magic on the screen. It just takes a section at every rebar from that complicated shape, whatever it may be, and it creates this uh, horrible looking rebar, which I don't recommend. But uh, what you would do in a realistic situation like this would be to actually have separate rebars on all four sides, and there would be um, there would be like U-shaped bars on all sides. But just to show you the power of the command, I, I wanted to take you through this so that you can get your certificate of advanced rebar modeler. One final word about the sectional reinforcement command. We, up till now, we've been using it for one single object. We created a few objects, but let's say you've got multiple objects on your screen. This, this could be for whatever reason, you, that's, that's the way you've modeled your structure. And you, uh, you want to actually create a section from all of them. So what you can do is, you can select all of them, all the, uh, they can be two, they can be three, they can be four, any number you want, and be uh, before you enter the command. And then when you enter the command, it will union them temporarily and ask you for a point. So let me select a point over there. And it will create a cross section from the unioned shape of those N objects. So let me go ahead and select uh, these bars, for example, right like that. Right click, it asks me for the final point. So I have to select the formwork object again for the final point. Right, let's say I show at this point, and I say right click, and immediately my bars are created from the section of that unioned object. So you have complete control over what you can do. You can even union objects together to create your rebars, and that's really better. Now let me show you the segment reinforcement command, which is also very useful. What it, the, what it does is all you need to do is select a segment of any bar. It doesn't have to be a closed loop or a stir up or anything. But all you do is you basically select a, a segment and right click. And immediately along the entire segment, uh, uh, these segment bars are created. And you can, uh, when you double click on them, you can change the count. For example, I can make them five bars. I can make them, if I make them five bars, what I can do is I can Say, okay, put five bars, but don't put the first and the last. So what that will do is it'll put the middle three and leave out the ones at the corners. If I leave that as it is, then all five will be placed. So let me put three bars over there. Uh, and I can do that very easily. I can do use the same command on the bottom uh, leg as well. Right click and immediately the segment rebars are created and this in this way you can very easily create your beams and columns uh, manually even if you if you needed to now another way to work with this is to let me undo that is to go to your segment reinforcement command select a, a, a leg but then don't right click but select point one and then select point two so it will then create those segment rebars between those points along with the offsets of course you have the uh, additional option of having these offsets to the start and the end. So you can very easily use that uh, those offsets and it will basically do the creation for you. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to the cranking of straight bars, for example. So we have this command for cranking over here. All you need to do is just select the command 
and select any straight bar and immediately it will be cranked in a certain direction. If you don't like the direction, what you can do is you can select the, uh, the points and just give them a move of say minus uh, 800, whatever direction which is suitable for you. Or if that's too much, maybe uh, you can bring them back up a bit. But very easily you can move it around and create cranks in the bar uh, as shown. And initially you can go in and actually modify the actual numbers of how, what you want these distances to be and the angles to be as well. Now let's do an extrusion example. So what I've done is I've created this little, uh, this cross section over here with double holes inside it. And I've extruded that along a curved path. So you can think of it maybe like a bridge. And uh, what I've done is then I'm using the sectional command, I've created uh, this stop bar inside it. I mean, we can create many bars with the section command around that and do that, do the whole thing in one go as well. But I've created just one. And uh, I have this path of the bridge over there as well. This is the curved path which I used for extrusion of the bridge. So all I'm going to do is now go to my uh, extrude rebar command. It asks me to select a rebar. I'm selecting this one. Then it asks me to select the parametric path, which is this one. And then it asks me to select the rebar parent, which is this bridge deck. And when I do that, immediately my rebar is extruded along that, the length of that, uh, that bridge. So imagine if you were doing this whole bridge cross section. All you would do is just quickly create using the sectional reinforcement all the sides, uh, give them a few modifications with their embedment lengths, and use the extrusion path to create the entire uh, rebar in the, in the, in that cross section. It's going to be that simple. Now here is a circular uh, water tank, and uh, one thing you might be thinking of is how do I how do I go about putting the circumferential rebars around such objects? There would be some over here, there would be some over here, and uh, all the way down into the slab. So to do that, what we can do is we can use our, once again, uh, we had the segment reinforcement, which went linearly, but then we also have a segment reinforcement, which goes uh, in a radial way or in a circumferential way. So if we do that, it asks me to select a segment. I can select this segment. I can select this segment or whatever segment of that bar. So let me select this one. And then it asks me for a start point for the rotation axis. So this point needs to be basically the middle of this um, cylinder, let's call it. So let's select this point and I need a vertical point above that. So I'm just going to hover over that and say DZ1000. I don't need to create the points. And when I do that, as you can see on the screen, immediately, let me, um, immediately what happens is that my uh, rebars are created outside of that segment. Uh, that could be the default. I can, I can reverse the direction to take it inside the segment now. Uh, and then what I can do is instead of a count of five, I could give them a spacing of 200. So now my bars are uh, spaced at 200. Now, as you can see, they're going all around the tank, just inside. I can give this another offset, so I can double click on that and give it a start offset of say 20 millimeters and an end offset of 20 millimeters. What that will do is that since we selected this segment, it's going to give it an offset of 20 millimeters from the start of the offset. Let's give it a bigger one to make it more clear. Let's make it 200 and 200 so that it's a lot clearer. So from the start of the segment, 200 down, and from the end of the segment over here, it's 200 up, and uh, we have our circumferential bars. But we're not going to uh, actually, uh, in, in real life, we don't put bars going all around. What we do is we typically, we start off from a certain angle, and we'll, we'll go 12 meters, and then we'll have a splice. So what we have, uh, the option we have over here is I can just double click on that, and I can, for the start offset and the end offset, I can say start from an angle of zero, but end at an arc length of 12 meters. So I can, I can have start from an angle of zero and end at an angle of, say, angle of 45 degrees. If I do that, then it's going to start at an angle of zero and end at 45 degrees. 
but if you notice over here every bar is of a different length these bars since they're at a short in a short, uh, at the top and the radius is smaller so their length uh, will be shorter and since at this point the radius from the center gets much bigger so their length will, so all of these bars will have a different uh, part position or uh, some variable length and we might not want that we might want them all to be the same length so what we can do is instead of using the angle option we can use the arc length option and when we do that then we are telling it to put a bar of 12 meters starting from angle zero on now all these bars will end at different points but they'll all be of a length of 12 meters and then you can repeatedly use the same command to start from zero 12 meters and then the, the next bar you can put is start from 12 me uh, 12 rather than 12 meters maybe 11 meters so it starts one meter short of that so there is there's a splice and start at 11 meters and end at say 23 meters from from the zero angle so you, you can go all around uh, and come back to the start and very easily create your spliced uh, rebars in uh, in this manner now let's repeat the same command which we did for this inclined segment for this vertical segment over here and all we need to do like i said is select the segment and then it asks us for that center of the um, of the cylinder and i can just select that point and press enter and say dz1000 and when i do that immediately you can see that my circumferential bars for this side segment have been created and this time they're different i have used the same from zero, angle 0 12 meters but since this segment is vertical they all end at the same point because all, all along the segment the radius from the center is the same and i can continue using it on on this segment and i can even use it on the bottom segment which is basically the closed slab and what you will get is the circumferential uh, rebars uh, on, uh, on the slab so by this simple command of circumferential rebars i can quickly um, model the rebars in this uh, in this tank i mean you can you, you can probably believe now that it, it, it is doable in uh, a couple of hours maximum so uh, now like, coming back to the original point which we which we have discussed uh, so many times the purpose uh, of this webinar for me is to relieve your fears of 3d modeling of uh, rebars to uh, ingrain in your minds that it's not difficult it's not time consuming even without macros even if you don't have i'm going to show you the macros in a second i know you're uh, you all want me to get to that point as well but uh, believe me when you're dealing with prestigious projects when you're dealing with high end projects and i'm sure many of you are you will be doing manual detailing as well because all those uh, twisted and curved and uh, ridiculous shapes which you will come up with or those uh, strange uh, looking uh, geometries which the architects will um, present to you will uh, they will not have macros necessarily to uh, to get you through them but what i've tried to show you today is that even without macros you can do uh, you can do the job pretty pretty easily now if we think about it in in reinforced concrete it is usually the surfaces which uh, need to be reinforced with steel so this is a slab and there's a top surface of the slab and there's a bottom surface of the slab as well it's got three holes in it right now and this is not a very uh, difficult slab uh, but the point uh, is that when we think of the top surface for example we see that uh, many different uh, positions part marks or re uh, rebar marks uh, so for example if we were to take this direction we will uh, have a rebar over here in this region then we will have a rebar in this region another one in this region then another one over here then there will be another one like that uh, and then another one in this region and uh, region so basically going from left to right there will probably be about, about 10 12 different uh, marks now the commands which i've shown you like sectional reinforcement or direct bar entry and uh, things like that you will need to create uh, each bar so for you need to create for example this bar by taking a cross section over there then one over here then another one over here so you you will need to do that uh, sectional reinforcement command uh, maybe 10 12 times to arrive at so a solution for the for the y direction of this uh, top surface 
Now, the same is true for the X direction. You will have a rebar along this line, then one between this area, then another one between this area, one at the back. And so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a little time consuming. But what if I showed you a command which would take the entire surface into consideration and all the holes in it in cons into consideration and find all the possible uh, areas where uh, reinforcement needs to be placed? and actually place that. So let's go to the surface reinforcement macro and uh, we select the slab, we right click, and then we right click again so that we don't want to select, it, select any other elements. And I'll talk about that in a second, but it then asks you for a surface. So you can select the top surface or you can press control to press the bottom surface, or you can select the side surfaces, basically any surface you can select. So let's select the top surface over here. It then asks for a direction of the bar. Uh, so let's give it the X direction first uh, as the main direction. When I do that, immediately on the screen, you have this uh, beautiful result. Now, the, um, the good thing about the way it has placed these rebars is that if you notice, it started off with a clear cover from over here. It's gone on, but then it has uh, realized that there's a hole over there. And so one bar needs to be placed just before that at a distance of the clear cover from that edge of the hole. And then from the other side, when the, where the hole finishes, once again, a rebar is uh, needed at, the clear, uh, at a distance of one clear cover from that point. And similarly, when you get to the end, the same thing is there. And then for the other region, it, it hasn't started immediately over here because there's no need and there's a, there's a spacing distance between the two. And once again, over here, we see that the, the um, Clear cover has been maintained as well as over here uh, and over here and everywhere. So this is important because what normally programs do is they will start off with a clear cover and then just put equally some uh, spacing wherever wherever they may go. So it'll start from here and end over here. The first and the last bars will be okay, but this bar might not be at exact clear cover, but it might be somewhere over here. And this bar might be maybe somewhere over here and there could be no bar with the clear cover. So what the user then needs to do is uh, he needs to go and individually check each and every one of these and uh, make slight modifications in their ranges so that to, uh, to ensure that the clear cover is maintained around uh, all the holes. But in Comosis, uh, what the surface macro does is it, it, it sorts that out for you very conveniently. Another advantage of the surface macro is that while it, it places all these uh, dozens of uh, different uh, rebar marks in one go, you still maintain individual control over each and every one of them. So for example, each one of them is actually a separate, if I press M and enter, you have separate control over each one of them. So what you can do, for example, is you can change uh, the spacing of only this particular part uh, and the spacing will be modified. Another thing you can do is you can change the end conditions, for example. So you can go in there and say, I don't want the embedment at the starting point. So when you do that, the embedment is released. So while you're doing the entire thing in one go, you still maintain individual control over all, all the individual uh, rebar positions. Another uh, huge advantage of the surface macro is that uh, like a while ago, I just placed the rebars in, the, in this direction. But you can ask the surface macro to uh, place the rebars both in the X and Y directions. So let me do that and select the top surface and give it the main direction. So this is the main direction. And the moment I do that, the rebars are placed in both the main as well as the secondary directions. It finds the secondary direction automatically perpendicular to the main direction. But now you have dozens of rebars, each separate. So there's uh, ones in the Y direction, ones in the X direction and you have complete control over each individual uh, one over there. This really facilitates your work. And if I want, I can immediately go back and uh, reapply it to the, to the bottom surface as well, for example. So I can select the bottom surface and tell it that my uh, main direction is uh, still the same, like this one. And now my bottom rebars are also placed in a single go. So I, in a few clicks, I have managed to create maybe a hundred different part positions, which are all uh, properly placed according to the clear covers ar around the holes. And I can then even modify them further if I wanted. 
sometimes when there is congestion or uh, embedment is different uh, is difficult for whatever reasons we use mechanical couplers uh, to do the same job and in commosis it's extremely easy to put couplers at the ends of rebar so all you need to do is just select the end of the rebar and the coupler will be created according to the um, according to the manufacturer standards so uh, you what you can do is you just select like i said the end and your couplers will be created and it's not that you can only create circular couplers uh, what you inside the um, the macro you have options to create rectangular ones for example so let's do that or what you also have the option is to actually uh, call a shape database in which you will be asked for a manufacturer and a family and, a, and the item the particular coupler which you have in your standards and you can all feed them into commosis through the shape editor and once you do that they will be recalled and you will create uh, very complicated couplers as well uh, as far as the geometry is concerned sometimes once again because of congestion uh, we need to put two bars together as a bundle so after having created your uh, surface um, uh, bars what you can do is you can just go to convert a rebar to double rebars and just select on the bar and right click and immediately each one of them will be bundled with another one of the same and that's very convenient for to convenient to quickly do that another option is available to actually convert it into three bars so you can what you can do is select the bar right click and now you've got three bundled together now what the surface macro does for you is very intelligently and very quickly it finds all the regions on a surface and places the bars beautifully uh, taking into consideration the clear covers at every hole uh, for you in, in a, with a few clicks but what it doesn't do for you is uh, is the fact that some of these bars may be longer than uh, for example 12 uh, meters so this one is 23.9 meters for example so these bars then need to be spliced after that and uh, you can do that with a multiple selection as well uh, but i'm just going to take you so all you do is basically you go to the splice uh, macro and you have your uh, splice operation rather we have the system of operations on top of surface macro which even if the surface macro runs again the operations are also modified every time you do that so you can have your spacing input so you can say to, uh, at every eight meters i want to splice you can uh, place extra bars you can shift the bars i mean i'm not going to go into the details of this this is very it's very detailed and lots of ways of doing the splice over here but all well, what I want to show you right now is you just uh, press the splice button and you can see all the different splice options over here. But you just press the splice button and you select this bar and you right click and you right click again. And immediately, according to your given uh, given dimensions of put a, put a splice at eight meters, you can even stagger these if you want. Uh, and another one over there. So your splices are created very conveniently and very easily uh, for you by this splice operator. Now, let's say we had a little column like this coming out from the side of the slab. So let's look at it from the top. And we want to embed these uh, bars, which are going inside the column, to, to actually go inside the column, but not these last two, because they're, they're outside the column. We could very easily do that with, with the surface macro. We're going to go to the range operations, say conform bar to a point, select this rebar, and then select a point which will be about one clear cover inside this column. So I just press this point and I say DY50. And when I do that, right click, immediately my this bar over here coming in is broken into two parts. One is what is left of it on, on the other side and one is uh, this one which is exactly at the clear cover uh, from the end of this column. Once we are okay with that, all we need to go, go is, uh, to do is to go to the path operations and say, I want to embed my rebar into another object. So what we do is we select this rebar at the end, then we se select the, the end point, and then we show the two parts which need to be union. So I show it the slab, right click, the column, right click, and right click again, and immediately the bar is extended into, uh, into the column. Once again, I have full control over the embedment length. So in this case, the default was 30 feet. Uh, if I make it 50 feet and I press OK, you will see that the length, embedment length changes. So these changes are, these kinds of modifications after having committed the surface macro are very quick and very easy to do, as you can see on the screen. And it will really make your job as a detailer very easy. 
So coming back to the fundamental theme of this webinar, uh, which is that we don't want to be scared of concrete modeling or rebar modeling in 3D. We can do that with the modern technology, which is available in, inside Comosis, and we can do that very easily, as you can see, uh, as I've been showing you for the last, uh, I don't know how many minutes. But the, the, the point is that uh, it, it is time to, uh, to take that big step. Uh, we we know that very few companies are into concrete and rebar 3D detailing. Very few, as compared, the steel sector is almost entirely uh, in, but the concrete sector uh, is, is unfortunately lagging for many reasons. But the the excuses are no longer there. The visionaries among you will 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 notice that the excuses are no longer there, and it is time for them to step up their game and actually make uh, the decision for. Now let's finally move on to the macros. And because we, what we want is that while we want a completely general purpose program, which will not let us down uh, when we're doing those complicated and prestigious projects, we also want the program to help us out when, it, when we are doing the very simple stuff like beams and columns and slabs and walls and single footings and all that. So on the right hand side, you see what we call container rebar macros. And the reason why we call them container rebar macros is when because when you run them, it, they, they create lots of rebars, and each rebar is actually uh, mostly created by the surface macro. So it leaves you with complete control, just like the surface macro does, even after you've executed the macro. So they're like macros which contain the surface macro inside them. So as you can see, we have one for a single beam. We uh, also have one for beams on an axis. So you have continuous beams and then you can place uh, all the reinforcement in them with a single command. For tie beams, for shear walls, which have these two areas at the ends, which, were re which are reinforced like hidden columns and then the reinforcement in between. Uh, normal wall reinforcements, closed wall reinforcements. For columns, uh, polygonal columns. For slabs, uh, th these can be slabs with holes. When you have the holes, you can have your whole reinforcement around them. You can have regions right under the columns which need to be strengthened with extra reinforcement. So these are like region um, reinforcement macros, single footings, point flares, stairs, corbels, and uh, whatever. So these are uh, the container macros which will get your work done even faster than uh, manual detailing for the normal, uh, most frequently found cases. Now, just to give you an idea about how they work, let's try the single footing macro, for example. So select that, select a single footing, right click to confirm, and then show it a direction for the main for the main side. And the moment you do that, it creates whatever the defaults are for the single footing macro. And what you can do is you can select any one of those bars and press M once to go to the surface macro, but M twice to reach the actual container macro, and then press enter. And it will open up and you can see there are lots of options inside for that. You can have top reinforcement, bottom reinforcement. You can have laser bars as well. But what I want to show you something is you can have your company standard set up for different uh, types of uh, situations. So here I have a two meter by two meter by 500 footing set up in my machine. I just load that. This is my company standard and I say apply. And immediately my company standards are rolled out uh, for that particular footing. Now, once we are happy with the with the single footing, what we need to do is we need to copy these rebars to the other footings. And uh, while this case is very simple, we only have two rebars and we can select them very easily. But if you imagine a more complicated scenario in which a particular assembly has dozens of rebars and the neighboring assemblies also have their own rebars coming in. So selecting the rebars in, in this jungle over here might be might become difficult. So imagine you've got 25 rebars over here and another 50 coming in from, from other sides, from the tie beams and this and that. Actually, just selection could be a problem. So what we can do is we can select any rebar belonging to that assembly, right click and say, select same parent rebars. And immediately, whatever uh, um, rebars there are, which belong to that particular footing of the bar, uh, which we selected, will be selected in a very, very conveniently. And once you have them, you can just right click and say, copy uh, to another object. And you can select the source footing and then you can select the target footings and immediately your uh, single footing or whatever it is that you're copying will be copied.
Now let's move on to the column macro, for example. So I just select the macro and I say select the column, right click, and it asks for a foundation, which it might need to embed the starter bars. So I show it the foundation, right click, and the uh, macro is run by defaults. All I need to do is just go inside the macro and see if I have any company standards set up. So I've got this one for similar columns. Let's load that and press OK. And immediately my column uh, is modified or my column uh, reinforcement is modified according to my uh, company standards for that uh, kind of a column. Now, this could be a situation where the selection I just talked about could become difficult. So you just select any bar belonging to the column, right click, say, select the same parent rebars, and the entire column rebars are selected. Right click, say, copy to object, show the column as a source column, and show the target columns and the other one. And your column uh, reinforcement is created in front of your eye. Now let's check the beams on an axis. So it could be a long axis. It doesn't need to be just two beams. It could be three, four, five. They could be of different uh, dimensions and uh, different spans as well. Uh, all you need to do is just click on this one, select the first beam, right click to approve, select the second beam, right click to approve, nothing more to select, just right click again, and your beam on an axis uh, macro will be, uh, will be created. Uh, with your stir up uh, confinement regions, three different confinement regions and all that. And you can go inside and uh, it will show you that you've chosen two beams. And for each individual beam, you can go to the data section and you will have complete control over the top reinforcement, bottom reinforcement, intermediate layered reinforcements, uh, the stir ups and uh, basically the, the whole, uh, I mean, everything you see on the screen the, uh, in the figures. You can even uh, have different embedment details for each individual one. So basically, you have complete, complete control over what you can uh, do with the individual uh, beams over here. Now, finally, for the container macros, because I don't have time to go through each, each one of them, but you do get the picture. Let me just quickly show you the shear wall macro, for example. You select the wall. You right click. There is no other wall to select. It asks for a starting surface, so I can show it the side surface. It then asks for an ending surface. I can show the other side. And then it asks for an inner surface. So I'm going to show it this inner surface. And the moment I do that, let me just look at it from the top. You can see that the uh, container macro for shear wall has created a basic shear wall uh, reinforcement uh, very quickly. Ob obviously, these parameters are all uh, modifiable. Uh, and we can open it up and we have the start area and the end cap start and the cap end and we can have different parameters for each one of them and different uh, longitudinal uh, reinforcements and cross ties and this and that so we've got a lot of detail over here but the point of the container macros is to, to do very quickly whatever um, things are very commonly uh, used in uh, reinforced concrete detailing but once again at the end i'll em emphasize that you can always go back to your general detailing and they're very fast as well. We're using the copies and the mirrors and the mirror and rotate commands, et cetera, using the handles, using the linear tapered, circular tapered, sectional commands. You, you just saw all that. Uh, but uh, obviously when you have your very standard beams and columns and walls and uh, footings, then you can come back to these as well. Now let's move on to the subject of uh, rebar drawings. And rebar drawings are of two types in uh, Comosis. You can have them created automatically in certain template cases. And I will show them uh, first. And these are completely automatic and they're very nice and beautiful. And you can, uh, you, you can maybe sometimes tweak them a bit if you need to. So one example I want to show you is of single footings, uh, which you can have in your, uh, um, in your project. And you can create automatic uh, drawings for them. All you need to do is just uh, select them and create the select the create drawing function. And I can show you the result uh, by going to a drawing over here, which has not been touched. This is completely uh, automatically produced. So you can see it it creates the drawing of the of the footing. It takes the sections. Uh, you can see the the sectional views for each footing uh, it gives them uh, the numbering and obviously the numbering has been done so it's very neat and clean the um, the drawing is almost as good as what you would do uh, manually with your hand if you if you if you did an autocad drawing and uh, this feature is very useful because every every project is going to have 
some footings and it, this uh, method will also work for uh, slabs or um, other types of flat foundations. Here we have some walls and shear walls. This is a shear wall with this area at the start and this area of uh, uh, reinforcement at the end. There are some normal walls over here with some holes inside them. And uh, we have produced automatic drawings for these as they are the way they were created directly by the program without any manual modification. And as you can see on the screen, it's pretty neat. You have your type one reinforcement, uh, which you see as lines over here. Let me turn on the line weights. And they've been very neatly uh, dimensioned automatically by the program. You can see the, the cross-sectional areas of the shear wall over here, for example. They have been, uh, all the position marks have been given. You can go to the material list over here. And you can see that every every position has been drawn on the screen. So we have, uh, I mean, this, this drawing is untouched. This is directly the way it was produced uh, by the program. And uh, you can use it directly as as it is. Now, if you remember, we had discussed about embedded steel and how it's important. And uh, you can have literally hundreds, sometimes thousands, and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of these embedded steel pieces. And creating the individual drawings of each and every embedded steel is a really time consuming task. It can be done in different ways. You can have a separate drawing for each individual embedded steel or you can have you can group them together. So here I have, um, I have a little drawing for you in which I've put in those five or six uh, embedded steel uh, pieces and created the drawing automatically for you. So let me turn on the line weights and you can see so this is the embedded steel when they've been numbered embedded steel one. Uh, you can see that there the, you can go to embedded steel three, which has got these rag boards behind it. They've been dimensioned. You've got embedded steel piece two. This has some shear keys behind it. As you can see, the drawing is very neat and it can be used uh, directly for manufacturing. Uh, there are some sectional views available to show the location of the rag bolts, etc. You can see uh, embedded steel number five, embedded steel number six. So they've been dimensioned properly and by a single click, you can produce embedded steel drawings. Like I said, you can put them into separate A4 or A3 sheets, or you can put them all into a, a, an A0 drawing if you want, if you want to. But uh, once again, the bottom line is that it's a huge time saver. Perhaps you're wondering about the drawings of uh, beams and columns and whether they can be produced uh, automatically, because I told you that the, the drawings of these simple template type things can be produced automatically, but you can also do a complete manual production of drawings for complicated uh, rebars. But uh, if you're if you're wondering about beams and columns, then uh, I can show you that the beam and column drawings can be produced uh, by Comosis pretty neatly. So let me go uh, to this produce drawing. Let me turn uh, this one is I think the column. So if I turn the column drawing on, uh, you can see that the column drawing has been produced uh, very neatly. Let me turn on the line weight detail and. Uh, it's been uh, dimensioned, the stirrups have been dimensioned, the levels have been given, and there are four columns or five columns, I don't know, and the sections have been taken. Uh, and you, you can see the sectional views individually for CL1, CL2, CL3, CL4, those are the column marks. And then you have your material lists uh, on the side as well. So as you can see, the drawing is very neat and clean. This has been produced uh, automatically by Comosis. And uh, like uh, always, these drawings will save you a lot of uh, time. Let's open the beam, one of the beam drawings over here. Let me double click on that. And as you can see, uh, those beams which are going across four axes, so we can zoom in the going from column one to column two to column three. Uh, they, they have been produced very neatly as well. The individual bars have been opened up below the beam so you can see them and you can see the dimensions and you can see the part marks uh, very neatly. The sections have been taken. You have complete control over where the section will be taken, how the section will be, how many sections you want. Do you want a section everywhere? There's some change or do you want just one uh, one in the center? Those kinds of customizations are available. Uh, but what you can see, this is a 2A0 drawing because the beams are long uh, going through several axes. Uh, but the quality of the drawing is pretty clear uh, from what you can see on the screen. Now, when uh, we create rebar drawings, especially of elements like 
slabs or walls, which are basically flat elements. Uh, we, uh, in, in the drawings, we either have plan views, like the one shown over here, in which we are looking at uh, the rebars uh, as lines, basically, from the top. Uh, or we have sectional views, as you can see on the right-hand side over here, in which we are seeing some of the rebars as lines and some of the rebars as, as dots. So these are very uh, typical to have a view, uh, a plan view and a sectional view uh, in, in your drawings. So now let's go to a, a drawing um, and see those plans and sectional views. Uh, so I've opened a drawing over here, and I can see this is this is the plan view which has been imported from the model. This is one sectional view taken from somewhere over here, and this is another sectional view taken from the middle. But the point is that all your bars, uh, let me turn on the, the line weights, all your bars are visible. Uh, so this bar is going from there to there. This bar is going from here to here. Each one of them is uh, has a certain range. There's only, only two bars, then this one in its own uh, region. This one has its own region. So they'll all have their own reasons. And from the sectional view also, we will see them as either lines or as dots. Now, uh, when we create drawings, we can uh, we usually have different styles of uh, representing these bars in the sectional views and in the in the, in the plan views. And normally what is done is that you, you take these bars individually. So for example, for this bar, what you will do is you will take it and instead of showing all the bars, you will show one representative bar and it, you will also show the range uh, across which it is, uh, it is going to be placed. And similarly for this one, you will show one representative bar somewhere. You'll find an appropriate place for it and then show the range. And you'll keep doing that until you go through all the whatever 500 position marks you have in that, in that slab. And that, that is, it, it, that is time consuming. And then, you would go down and do the same for uh, for the dots. So you will have a, a dimension of, of these uh, dots over here, then another one for these, and then another one for these. Um, and you'll keep doing that until you finally get to the end of the drawing. And that, that is uh, time consuming. In Comosis, uh, we have a feature which is very suitable for situations like this in which you have uh, plan views and sectional views. And what you do is you just select a particular viewport that's all you need to do. Just select the viewport and press this auto annotate the viewport for rebars. And when you do that, let me just do that. Immediately, you see on the screen that all that thing which you were going to do manually, that this is leaving one bar and giving its range. So, for example, you have this bar and it tells you the range. And you actually, this, this range is selecting two bars, the bottom bar and the top bar. Uh, so what it does uh, is do automatically for you what this, this could have taken you maybe uh, 15, 20 minutes, but it's, it's going to take you a second now. You can do the same in your sectional view as well, by the way. And when you press that button, the sectional uh, rebars have been um, annotated and dimensioned uh, given giving their spacings and all that is required. And you can go to this view as well and just press the button again. And once again, your uh, rebars have been dimensioned and the, you can see the position numbers and the spacings and the and the diameters. Now, this is very. Um, this is a huge time-saving feature because what you can you can you can choose to uh, have your filters of just the top reinforcement only, and then another one for the bottom reinforcement, or, or all of them put together. So here you can see it's also labeled them, labeled them as bottom and top. Uh, it, it all depends on how you filtered up the system, but the the drawing. But uh, the point is that what would normally have taken you maybe about 35, 40, 45, depending on your speed, obviously, has literally taken you a few seconds. And this is very, very useful. For more general and more complicated cases, you can always create your uh, rebar drawings manually as well. You can go uh, in and you can dimension them with automatic dimensioning commands. When I say dimensioning, I mean, I mean auto annotation of the rebars so that they get their bar numbers, etc., and the counts and the number of bars, etc. Sometimes things can get really complicated and you, you need to uh, then go in and do some manual modifications to the to whatever has been provided for you. But your material lists will be produced automatically in all cases. And uh, that is that, that's a major uh, time saver, even in the complicated cases. Here you see some eccentric foundations which are not centered. 
and they've been uh, created or uh, the data the details have been done manually and uh, you can see that the the results is the results are very uh, neat and clean once again rebar modeling is actually um, it will save you a lot of time if uh, in uh, as far as the bottom line is concerned it seems as if it it's an extra time you spend on modeling but the reality is that all that time which you spend on modeling does two things first of all it saves up immensely on your uh, drawing creation time because the, the modeling is the one which takes more 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 of your time and the second thing is it the, the quality of your drawing gets much better so there's no contradiction between your plans and your sections if it's modeled correctly if you, if what you see on the screen is right then the drawings will also come out to be exactly in accordance with that here are some more samples of rebar drawings another one over here another one over here some rebar dimensioning in the plan view we have commands which actually produce uh, these dimensions automatically as well once you have imported your rebars into the drawing you can just click on a button and it will convert all the all the multitudes of rebars which you are seeing on the screen into these uh, simple ones which you can then uh, move around to, if you want to clean them up even more and you can even produce entire drawings made of nothing but material lists uh, which can cover basically the entire or whatever part of the structure or the entire structure maybe for procurement purposes uh, or whatever other purpose might, uh, might uh, you might have and that's it for today once again i couldn't show you half the stuff i wanted to but i know you all must be exhausted i am but i hope you're also a bit excited if you're detailers working in some company i hope you're thinking of going back to work and convincing your superiors about uh, what what you saw today if you're decision makers i hope i have succeeded in making you think about the possibilities which 3d modeling can provide and its potential benefits to your business by the way whatever claims i have made today are not claims of a software developer who has no grounding with the realities of the design industry i have personally used almost every software under the sun and i know what the constraints are and our team has worked tirelessly towards eliminating those constraints if used with the proper skill sets commerce will save you time and money it will increase the quality of your work and just as importantly it will make you enjoy what you do as well so with those thoughts i want to end this webinar it's two down one to go so the marathon continues next week we will meet again this time i'll be showcasing the finite element analysis and design capabilities of commerces once again i'm uh, i'm actually sorry for making you wait so long and i hope it will all be worth it for you and your company in the end stay safe and see you next week